sometimes there's just too much to talk about. It's St. John's Eve and it's just past midsummer. Although I always feel, well, you know, midsummer lasts for about a week. And um, I doubt if I'll get round to those conversations today because I was intending to speak about how I contextualise faith in terms of story. And that led me to think about so many people who ask for some sort of, you know, more stuff about how to write. Okay, so this week I thought I'll try to talk about story and it's definitely for some people who are interested in learning more about creative writing, how to write a novel or how to write a memoir and if you're out there and you're thinking like uh, you'd like to write a memoir, well, this is the kind of thing that I'd say to you. How to tell a story and what is the shape of the story. Right, So, there's any amount of places you can go to online to find stuff on the art of storytelling. And it is really, really valuable. I didn't have it in my time when I was trying to learn how to to write. And in those days we used to have to read books. But now you can really pinpoint any book in any library and and just get the precise bit by Google searching it. So you find out, you know, how to tell a story or how to write a memoir and Google it and you'll find loads of stuff. And that's the stuff that you'd get if you went and did a master class with somebody because the, the kind of, the fabric of storytelling doesn't change. And people make different versions of it, but it's still the same stuff. So I'm going to go on about that a little bit, but but from a faith point of view, you can also keep it in the back of your head that that where I'm going with this is really to talk about my own personal faith. So how does that fit into storytelling as a writer, and then how does it fit into religion? Um, I'll go. I'll start with my own little nuggets, the things that have worked for me as important during my life as a writer. And it would be in a column or in a book or a novel or a play or a memoir. And one of the first is to know your world. K-N-O-W. Know your world. And to know your world is like the beginning and end of how you write. Because like, if if I'm talking to you even on a podcast, and if I'm talking about my own personal faith and my life in Leitrim, or if I'm writing a memoir about my life in Leitrim, or if I write a memoir about being sick or being ill or being in hospital, then there's one thing for sure, and that is I know the world. So I, I won't be pretending anything. I won't be making it up. And that gives you a great authority. And... If you think about it like uh, if you were at a dinner table, if you were at a dinner party and somebody asked you to give your opinion on the British Conservative Party or maybe the troubles in Northern Ireland or maybe the inflation that everybody in Europe is suffering or maybe the, the war in Ukraine and you felt... You know, just to be polite, you have to reply and you start talking and you're you're trying to answer that question in a coherent way. But you know that you're wobbly. You know that you're you're just not confident because you don't know that world intimately. We all do it. We all do. We sit around talking about, you know, Boris Johnson or Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Ukraine or France or whatever. And what happens when we don't know our own world, when we don't know that world intimately, we end up using cliches that we've heard from other people. So somebody puts me on the spot and, and says, what do you think of um, of Donald Trump? And I don't know what to say, but I remember a, an editorial I read in the 
New York Times, and I start seeing things that I remember from that article. It's like being at an examination. And that happens to us, but, but it's never your own opinion. And the problem then is that other people are doing the same thing. And what happens is you get this thing of the chattering classes, that, that the sort of cliched conversations that nearly happen at every table. So you get some paper that's a, a leading opinion maker, maybe, let's say, the Irish Times, and it has a strong opinion on some particular thing about the economy. And you find that that everybody around all the little dinner tables in the country are saying the same things and expressing the same opinions as if it was their own. And I think that's how humans behave. I mean, I mean the strongest thing we have as humans is the ability to mimic or imitate. And it's probably true to say that language first emerged through imitation. There's, there's something about the birds cawing, you know, the seagulls. You can hear it in little flocks of birds, that they imitate each other. I always feel that, for example, cats, and this is a completely irrelevant point, but I always feel that, you know, when the cats meow, they're imitating a baby. Because cats decided about 11,000 years ago to transition, if you like, and to become attached to humans in a way that here, here before then they weren't. And so, and they only meow to humans. So it seems to me that they're actually mimicking sounds that they know demand attention. And I think it's why sometimes I have a couple of women friends who are mothers and who can't resist succumbing to the demands of the cat when the cat meows. And there's definitely something terribly pleading about a cat's meow. So I'm, all I'm saying here is that there's a level of mimicry and imitation. And I think that we probably all used it as we evolved language. Well, now, if that's the case, then any sort of mimicry is not going to be good for storytelling because it's going to sound like something else and like everything else. And when we talk about originality in storytelling, we're talking about something that's not mimicking anything. And you'd imagine that's a hard thing to do but the simple way that you do it is to know your world and to be speaking out of that world all the time. Now, you might say that's kind of fairly obvious and that that wouldn't be a problem if you were writing a memoir. However, somebody could write a memoir and they would be trying to write about their school days, let's say, grew up in in Ireland, and they're writing a little description of the secondary school. Just just suppose it was me, for example. So I'm writing about my secondary school. Well, you'd say, you know the world, so there's no question. You don't have to think about this. But in fact, you do. Because even when you're writing about something you think you're familiar with, you you tend to put in ideas that you got from somewhere else. So, like, it's amazing the amount of memoirs that I've read where, let's say, growing up in the country has the same memories. There was hardship, there was no electricity, and we had to work on the farm, blah de blah We went to school and the teachers were tough <clears throat> and they slapped us and, and sometimes they were brutal. And you get the same memoirs, somebody writing in Kerry, somebody writing in Donegal, somebody writing in Mullingar. And it's the same things they go for. So that means that even if you know your world, and you say, well, I'm, I'm going to write about my own experience in secondary school, what happens is that you tend then to, to impose on it 
borrowed ideas or perceptions about what it was like in secondary school. Or or even what what is the general opinion about secondary school. Supposing that the general opinion on secondary school is now that, let's say, you know, uh, sexual abuse and bullying were quite prevalent. Well, And then you find yourself writing this. You find yourself discovering and selecting the memories that fit a wider pattern. And in some sense, you begin to think, well, that's for approval. You know, if if I said that at a dinner table, people would approve of me. And if I write it in the book, people will approve of the book. You know, because, and that's the way we are. We try to be nice. We, we try to say things that people are already familiar with. We love to see people nodding their head affirmatively as we speak. We, we don't like people looking at us with their eyes staring at us as we speak. It makes us nervous. Maybe I'm, something, maybe I'm saying something shocking or different. And basically when you're around a dinner table, you're trying to talk in a way that simply is a process of bonding with the people around the table. You want to be liked. You want to be with the group. You want to be in the group. And if all the group agree that they're, let's say, supporters of the Labour Party and totally against the Conservative Party, and you personally actually think that the Conservative Party are quite quite a good crowd of people, you just might keep your mouth closed. You, you just might not say it. You might say it going home in the car. I didn't agree with what they were saying about the Labour Party, but I didn't want to say it. You don't want you don't want to cause an argument. Now that is all okay at the dinner table. So it's finding a sense of belonging and community. But as a writer, that works in the opposite way. People are not going to like you. If all you have to say is a collection of things that have been said before. So how do you get out of the loop of all those ideas scattered about in our heads that are collective agreed ideas about what life was like growing up in Ireland, what what was life like in secondary school, what was courtship like so on and so forth everything that we have collectively is no good in the story and in fact the only way to do that is every page you write every time you put a new chapter a new kind of subject so you you put a head headline going to dances so you're writing a memoir and you put up a headline, going to dances. And you're going to try and remember now all the little adventures you had when you were going to dances. You have to put out of your head all the things that are common and held in common about going to dances. And you have to know your world, which is get really down into the nitty-gritty of your memory and your experience. I could tell a story, let's say, of going to dances and my two images would be that we could dance so well and feel so lively simply because the floorboards of the dance hall had been laid down on tractor tyres. That's one memory. Another memory would be the intense smell of brill cream in the men's toilets and the little combs and the grease on the combs as the lads would be queuing up in front of a tiny mirror to comb back their oily hair and make it look as much as they could like Teddy Boys or Elvis Presley. That's my memory from a specific place. And another memory would be in the town hall in Cavan when a row broke out between young lads who were in the army and local fellas 
who were annoyed with the army fellas dancing with girls from their area of the town. Now, that's my world, in the sense that there's, there's nobody else from other places can have those experiences. And that's what's unique about them. So when somebody says to me, if they read something by me and they're, they're, they're being kind to me and they say, you know, you know, you, you just write, you know, really original or you write something different or, you know, you show us a way to see it that we never saw before. That's because every page I'm saying, I must know the world. It must be my world. Another way of putting that, to know your world, put it this way. If I was never in prison and I wasn't a woman or a lesbian, I wouldn't write about a lesbian experience in prison because I wouldn't know anything about it. So I will only write about what I know, what I've experienced. And that and that's really why you end up it's why I ended up writing memoir. But but it is the principle of how to write well in memoir is to ruthlessly come out of your own experience and on every page check yourself that you're not beginning to impose ideas. So if I had sentences about the dance halls that I used to dance in, and then I started saying, in those days, in those days, there was no alcohol served in the dance halls, and people would often have a drink beforehand, and then they would come to the dance, and the men would be on one side and the women would be on the other. That's fine. But you know that, and I know that, because we've all read that somewhere or other in various magazines, newspaper articles and books. And so if I accidentally started writing that way, in general, I suppose that's a good phrase for it, where you start writing in general, because you think, well, I need to explain the context to the reader. But you don't, you know. You need to get all that out of the way. All the explaining. Get it out of the way. Tell your story. And then sometimes what's wonderful is if you're a little bit ahead of the reader, the reader finds it more interesting. You know, if if you start an opening sentence saying like, when Johnny went out, to the yard, he found that the creamery can was empty. He came back into the house immediately, looking for the wife. Now, there's two sentences, but we don't know where they're going. Maybe maybe Johnny was expecting that the wife would have filled the creamery can earlier. Because maybe it's in the context of a farm. We don't know. Maybe... Maybe he was going to use the creamery can to put explosive in, explosives in it to blow up his neighbour. We don't know. But we don't stop reading. In fact, we keep reading because we're fascinated. The, 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 the storyteller is a step ahead of us. And we have to keep up with him. And the only way to keep up is to keep reading. On the other hand, if I had started that story by saying in the 1960s when I grew up, people still went to the creamery. Well, I can hear the reader snoring because sure, he, the, she or he knows that. Even, even if I said, if I started the story with a sentence like during the troubles in Fermanagh, a number of atrocities were committed by using creamery cans were back asleep because I'm just generalising I'm just saying things that 
maybe everybody doesn't know, but certainly some people know from reading certain bits of history. And so everything that's not personally your world needs to be got out of the way. And that is first principle on memoir. First principle. Know your world. There's another one that I often would use, and that is everything happens through conflict. And I take that from Aristotle. The first great book on a theory of drama was written by Aristotle in a book called Aristotle's Poetics, and it's only a couple of pages, and you'd get it on the internet. And in that, he goes through things like how everything must happen through conflict, and then the protagonist needs to, there needs to be a main per- person who's a protagonist, and, and that there's a reversal, that at some point in the game, things go against. I've, I've done a podcast before where I talked about purpose, passion, and perception. It's a very quick shorthand for this. Uh, David Mamet, great American writer, put this together. Basically, that the, the first thing you need in your story is purpose. You need somebody with an intention, with a purpose. And then you need to show ways that that purpose is reversed. You know, if the woman is looking out the window and she says to herself, I'm going to build a patio out there next summer. That's my plan. Well, that's her purpose. And people will read and follow the story as long as they're following the purpose. And the next thing you need is a reversal. And the big reversal, let's say I'm going to build a patio out there next year and there's a husband sitting behind her eating his boiled egg and he says to her, you will in your arse. And immediately we see the conflict. And we see the purpose is going to develop through conflict with this energy that's going to go against her. And the final bit in the whole shape is what they call perception. And that is that the hero makes the journey. There is a reversal at some stage, but still the hero makes the journey. And at the end of the journey, they achieve what they wanted to achieve, but not in the way that they intended. Not in the way they intended. It's it's like we don't know how the cookie crumbles in life. It never turns out the way we imagine. And in the little story about looking out the window uh, for the patio, I always end that, when I'm talking in workshops, I always ended with the, the possibility that you know, a year later, she's sitting on the patio with her neighbour and the neighbour is saying, that's a lovely patio, wasn't it? A great thing that you got it built. And she's there smiling and saying, yes, it is. And then the neighbour says, where's your husband? He never came back from England that time. Is he gone forever? And she says, oh, I don't know where he is. And of course, we know he's under the patio. But again, you don't have to say that It's called writing on the nose, if you say it. And in every word you write, when you're shaping your story, it's always better, don't write on the nose. Don't make the intention obvious. But show rather than tell. Show what you're doing. So if I showed a man with a creamery can that was empty and he takes it away to a shed and then he's putting explosives in it. And he's looking out the window of the shed and he sees his neighbour going by in a tractor and he's whispering to himself, that old bastard. Well, now the reader will begin to link his contempt for the neighbour with the fact that he's filling the milk churn with explosives. That's showing. You're not telling. And 
All those things, folks, are available on the internet. All those kind of principles and ideas are hugely available on the internet. But if there's one that I would say, one simple way to write, whether it's a book, a, a fiction book, or a memoir, and I say this particularly about memoir, is to know your world. To write personally about the details of your What is my world this morning? Ask yourself that. And if I'm talking about myself back in, let's say, <clears throat> Maynooth Seminary, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I never sort of talk in general about religion or seminaries or what it was like in general. I'm going to try and always remember a detail that was my world. So, like, I can remember the faint smell of wood in a little room on the third floor of a house in the seminary called Logic House. And I'm looking out the window and it's dark because it's six o'clock in the morning and I can see nothing. And then suddenly in the distance I can hear the sound of the train the Galway Dublin train. And as it passes, I can see the lights of the windows just beyond where the perimeter wall of the seminary is. And I can see the lights in the windows of that train passing. And it makes me always feel that I'm in a secret world, an enclosed world, and that's the outside world kind of knocking on the door. Reminding me that there is a world out there. And then a few seconds later, the bell goes that calls us to morning prayer. And I rise and I always remember in the winter mornings at a quarter to seven, walking across Sometimes snowy ground, frosty ground, sleet in my face, using the soutane, the big long black soutane, making sure it's buttoned up to the very top because it works like a coat and protects me from the sleet and the sleet on the sleeves of it. And as I pass, heading for the oratory, I pass this crucifix, this outdoor crucifix, and I always find something strange about the snow on the flesh of Christ. Something in that dawn, in, not even dawn, in darkness still in winter, black, black, pitch black. And I'm passing there and I see the crucifix. It's a big, nearly, you know, with a kind of a shelter on it, like a little roof on it. I think it's gone now in Maynooth, but anyway. I'd pass it and I would feel that the sleet on the white skin, I, did, I didn't think of the white skin as, you know, marble or whatever it was made of. I saw it as the Christ hanging on a cross and the sleet. And that used to affect me about my, my sense of feeling about Christ being in suffering. It made it easy in the morning to get up. It made it easy to go into the church. It made, it, it made the glow of the little oratory, I think it was called Joseph's Oratory, and it made the glow and the warmth of it very pleasurable. In we were, soft and cosy, 200 clerical students at the time there would have been up to 200 and outside I'd still I'd still be thinking of Christ outside in the snow naked now that's a surreal memory 
But it's my world. It's my memory. It's my... There's nobody else could describe Manuth like that. Because that's the very personal thing that I experienced. It's not something that is an opinion. It's not something that's a view about what Manuth was like. It's not an information point. It's not telling you what clerics were like in those days or whatever. It's simply, that's my world. That was my world back then. That is my world now, remembering it. And so so that's the biggest thing. And to just sum up on this, and then I'll move on, but it's like purpose, passion, perception. Uh, having a reversal in your story, even if it's a memoir. There must be some way that you begin your memoir by saying, this is what I wanted. So if it's a memoir about life, it's not a kind of a flat account of, well, I was young and I grew up here, and then I did this, and then I did that. It must be always some sort of purpose. And the best one to use in memoir is is really the search for meaning, because that's the basic thing in life that holds us together. And therefore, what can life be about but the search for meaning? I use that all the time. Every book of memoir that I write is always the search for meaning through the experiences of my particular world. So when I wrote Staring at Lakes, it was a memoir about midlife crisis and mental breakdown and depression. But it wasn't just an account of them. It was the search for meaning through those experiences. And in the next book I wrote was Hanging with the Elephant. Again, it was hugely a book about my mother and my experience of grief at the passing of my mother. And that's an interesting thing too, that supposing you're writing about your mother, well, I could have written about my mother in many, many different ways that would have described her and she would end up sounding and looking like any other woman that lived in the 1950s and was born in 1920. But what I wrote about, and even if I wrote about her like in old age, I could write well about her in old age, but I'd still be writing the same things that you'd read in a hundred books about old people. You know, they... They stumble around the place, they use Zimmer friends, they have tablets, they end up in nursing homes. It's it's like the same story. So how do you make it worth reading? The answer is, know your world and only write about your world. Now, what's my world in relation to my mother? It's not actually my mother. It's how I felt about my mother. So you always put yourself in the picture and expose yourself. You don't just write like John... <clears throat> well, I was going to say you don't just write like John McGahern. I mean, please do write like John McGahern. If you're, if you're that good, you'll be a genius, a, a master. But what I meant was that you don't just write objectively about the reality that's out there. In a memoir, you put yourself in the middle of every part of it. Right? So... Again, I keep coming back to the idea of to know your world. And the way that I find purpose in that is, number one, I'm always searching for meaning. And secondly, I never find meaning. And that's simply a theme. I do it in the podcasts over the past two years, And I really try and share passionately the same concept. The ultimate teaching is there is no teaching. The ultimate meaning is there is no meaning. The ultimate conclusion of life is that there is no conclusion. The ultimate God to worship is that which is beyond all 
descriptions of God. And, and that's the way I do the memoirs. It's the way I do every page. If I'm writing a page, let's say just an article, a column for the Irish Times, I try and leave it at the end that we all long for meaning. And so my memoir is I have searched for meaning, but I haven't found meaning. But the very search for the meaning is itself the meaning. And that is the old thing about memoir. A few other little short ideas to finish off with. The idea of memory and story is interesting to reflect on. In other words, if you're writing a memoir, jot down not a chronological line of your life but jot down memories and when you get to a memory they have an amazing way of opening up other memories it's almost frightening you know it's almost frightening how everything that you experienced is on tape in your head everything and it's probably why we suppress stuff there are things we suppress that we do not remember. We erase. At the surface level, we erase them because they're linked to maybe horrific events and traumas that we wouldn't be capable of dealing with. And so we, we kind of cauterize it like a wound. And it's still there. Every memory leads to another memory. When I said to you, for example, about the the milk churn, and the man looking out the window. I was thinking of a powerful story that Eugene McCabe wrote about living on the border. But I, I'm, I'm also remembering a time when I lived in Fermanagh during the Troubles. And because I pulled up that little detail, you know, the detail about the milk churn and the man going out kind of a sort of a brutish man going out and finding it empty and then he goes looking for the wife it's kind of just an image but that is a memory and that memory brought me back to a particular human being who who you know, he was in near near uh near west calf near belcu that kind of black lion area but he was a farmer and he had children. And I used to meet the children. And they seemed very sad. And they seemed very frightened. And they seemed never able to, you know, have joy. And you'd say to yourself, that's unusual now for a child to be like that. And one day I got an opportunity to visit the house. I was a school teacher at the time. And I got an opportunity to slip into the house and say hello to the mammy and daddy. And the mammy was a, a large woman and she was baking bread or something at the table when I went in. It was an old-fashioned kitchen. And she left the room as I came in. And the boss man, who was a very big man, a big burly man, came in quietly from the scullery door. And he called me by my first name and said, you're welcome now. What can I do for you? And he eyeballed me. And I felt like I was in enemy territory. And I said, which was true, there was, there was a rope I needed to tow me Cortina. I said, somebody sent me, to said, that you have a, a tow rope, you know? I'm stuck down the road. He says it's out in the shed. I went out to the shed with him. And he got it, and he was very understated, and I wrapped it up, and he said, do you want to lift it? Are you far away? I said, no, it's only down the road near Black Lion. I'll be able to walk. It's ten minutes. Thanks very much. I'll leave it back with you when we get the car going. 
And then he stood there and the two of us were standing with our back to the door of the shed and we were looking out into the sky and it was a grey owl, you know, not unlike the day that's in it at the minute, to be honest with you, you know, very heavy with clouds of rain, but not yet falling. And there we were standing, he's looking up at the, and he says, um, for some reason, he says, the apples will be very bitter today, this year. I don't know what he meant. But if I was writing a memoir, I would use that story. And I would use it because I'm in it, because my emotions are in it, and because at the end of it, I'm confused. I'd actually use it because I don't know what it means as a story. And yet I know that it would have an energy for the reader. And it would it would kind of evolve the narrator, the, the main character, the me, it would evolve a man on a search, a quest for meaning. And he's not getting it in this house, whatever meaning he's looking for. So that's how I write. And I give you that example because the milk churn just brought me there. And it could have as easily brought me to a beautiful, warm and lovely memory of a man who was a creamery manager in another part of the country when I was a child. And I always remember he married a woman from Cork. And in those days, I never saw many people from Cork. And I used to go out to her house and she used to smoke cigarettes. And she'd call me, me hall. Because in Cavan or in Donegal, my name would be pronounced Michal. Michal in Cavan or Michal in Donegal. Michal, come here, Michal. And I heard the, the Cork woman and she'd say, Well, Michal, come in here till I have a look at you. And she'd do the cigarette on the side of her mouth. And she was married to the creamery manager. And sure enough, the creamery house, as it was called, was close by to the creamery. And sure enough, as he'd be going up there, he'd be looking at creamery cans. Now, those two memories are totally unrelated, and yet I'm thinking about that woman now. And I'm thinking, may she, may she rest easy. May the light of heaven fall upon her. May the light of heaven fall upon that man that I met in the other place who I was uneasy about myself. He seemed like a, an angry man that wasn't shown as angry, right? And the children seemed like people who were suffering anger and not able to say it. And the wife seemed like somebody who was terrorised by him, like like he was an emperor and she was a slave. But I don't say those things. That would be writing on the nose. I try and show what the nature of those relationships were or may have been like. And I don't even judge them because all I do is bear witness to my own experience of it within that situation. Right? And that, my dear friend, that's the way to write. Put yourself there in the middle of it and bear witness. Now, I'm going to go on with this because I feel I'm doing well here. I, I, I feel that I've got across something that is really worth. I'm going to put Art of Memoir on this podcast as a title so that people can come to it even separately as as a podcast about the art of mem mem memoir uh, the personal past as opposed to the public past that's another way of putting it that if you're writing a memoir and you know you've lived a life in Galway and you grew up in an orphanage let's say and you were adopted, you were fostered, and, and then you went to England, and then you came home, and, and then you finally went to school, and you got an education, and you became an electrician, and you got happily married. And Right, supposing that kind of story is your story. 
well, everything I've said about that story, you put it into the book and nobody will read it. Because we've read it before. We've read it a hundred times. We've seen it on television. That's, if you like, the public past. Or if you were ordained a priest or you were a sister or, you know, you were in religious life somewhere and you tell that story at a public level, you know, how it happened at this time and you got a vocation and then you went and then you learned how to be, you know, in Minute and then you got a parish and then it was strange meeting, you know, and the people were beautiful and you had a fulfilling life. Fine. But still, it's like, that's the public past. What we need is the picture of, you know, the young priest after his ordination. I remember one time in Manute when we were ordained the deacons. And it was that major orders, like that's a really, you know, no return from there kind of moment. And people's parents would be in attendance. Their mothers and fathers would be all up from the country in the big chapel in Manute. And five or six or seven hundred people squashed into it. And the ordinands, the, the guys for ordination, might be about 70 of them, you know. And then when it'd be over, there'd be all photographs. You'd see them all outside in their collars and nice black fancy suits with mammy and daddy on either side taking photographs. And I remember one young fella. And he was walking on his own. I won't say his name, nearly said his name, but he was walking on his own. And I followed him down the cloister. And he went down the cloister in Minute where the photographs are of the of the class. And he looked at his image in the class. And then he went on down and up the stairs, a stone stairs up to what they call St. Mary's. It was a, a big old building at the bottom, the far end of Minute. And in there he went, that's where everybody lived. But nobody was up there. They, all those rooms were empty because everybody was outside with Mammy and Daddy. Right? But up he went on his own. And I thought, you know something? He he had nobody outside. I didn't know at the time that his mother died when he was about four years of age. And maybe his father just didn't want to come. Or was too busy with creamery cans or something. I don't know. But I copped that he was alone. And I thought, I wasn't being, even though this was my class, I have to tell you the whole detail, even though it was my class, I wasn't being ordained that day because the authorities were suspicious that I was unsuitable. So they, they, they held me back. So that's where I was. But, so I was free. Well, I decided I'll go up now to your man and I'll, you know, say hello to him. And we could have a nice day. And I went up and I knocked the door and he opened the door and the tears, he was just finishing, wiping them from his eyes as he opened the door. I said nothing. I said nothing about the tears. I said nothing about the loneliness. I said nothing about his mother. But I know how he felt. And over the years, over decades... I've understood that, how Mary, the mother of Christ, the mother of God, Mary, the beautiful queen of heaven. And you see her in, in Knock, and I have to say, I, I must do a podcast on Knock, because that's a wonderful place. It, it's full of comic memories for me, from the time I used to go with my granny, but it's also a wonderful, wonderful place of, I found it anyway. I was coming back from the eye doctor in Galway three or four times and I actually go past knock and go in and sit there. There's three different oratories or chapels or churches, whatever you want to call them, and, and they're wonderful places. And I go in there and I just sit in my confusion. Buddhist, Christian, Catholic, Orthodox and everything else, you know. And I just sit there. And I find I can receive a certain sense of calm that you can only describe 
as a mother's love. I feel it when I'm out under the trees and I feel it at the ocean. I feel a mother's love. Like, like you can only say it, the Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God. May she envelop you in her tenderness. And the first time I saw the need for that was when I opened that door in Manute. And your man, I could see him. He'd, he'd just finished wiping the tears, you know. They were gone. But the residue was there. And you looked in his eyes. He missed his mammy. And he was a, a deacon now. He was committed now to a new mother. He had for life a mother. I think that's one of the most amazing and wonderful things about religion, that it, it gives us these archetypes that substitute for the inadequacies of everything else that happens to us in life and gives us a completion of motherly love, of fatherly protection, and also brotherly love, sisterly love. It gives us the whole template to feel complete. And do you see what I've done? I've accidentally slipped into talking about religion. I can't, I can stop talking about religion. This is about the art of memoir. And I'm talking all the time about know your world and I'm talking about the personal past as opposed to the public past, right? Now, the shaping of memoir Use the conventional structure of a good story. The purpose, you have a, a protagonist who is yourself, but the real key is give that person a purpose. You know, I always wanted a family. I always wanted a husband. I always wanted to be rich. I always wanted to live by the sea. I always wanted a patio. I always wanted to sing for Ireland. I always wanted to ride a horse. Those are, if you like, titles that could work for a memoir by some individual person to tell their individual story. There's another important issue about the memoir, and that is who are you writing for? Hmm? Because your story, and let's say the story that I just told you, these are shaped differently for different audiences. If I was telling all that story about Manuth, if I was at a dinner table, I might find it inappropriate. I might find, well, these people around this table wouldn't want to be hearing such a personal testimony. And so if Manuth came up as a conversation and somebody asked me, what did I remember? I might talk about Manuth in general terms, but I might filter what I was saying. And the problem is that when you're writing a memoir, Sometimes, because you're thinking, well, this goes out into the public, you begin to filter it. You begin to talk in your writing like you talk at the dinner table with people that you don't really know terribly intimately. Friends, yes. You're, you're at the dinner table with friends, but you don't just spill out all your emotions. Your personal stuff. Okay. So if you unconsciously think you're writing for that group of people, and that's usually what you, what you mean by the public, it's not going to be interesting. You need to write for the one you love. McIntyre, Tom McIntyre used to say to me, you, you can't write, he says, unless you're in love. 
You can't write unless you're in love. You can only write to the person you love. Now, think how differently I would tell you about Manut if I was speaking to a group of people around the table who I didn't necessarily like, never mind love, just their acquaintances. I would filter what I'd be saying. Even though I'd be talking about my life, you know, I, I know your world, I'd be obeying that rule, uh, speak personally and not about public memory, I'm, I'm doing that good. But now the next thing is, who am I talking to? Well, I'm talking to, you know, the public, so I need to have a little bit of decorum. Well, you know, the answer is no, you don't. You need to write every sentence like it would never be published, but like you're going to give it to somebody you love. And that somebody doesn't have to be your present partner, it could be, and for me, the best way is is like somebody who's not really, somebody who's transcended this world, if you like, I'm talking about those who have gone before us marked with the sign of peace. You know, the uncle you loved, the father you loved, the mother you loved. But write to them as if you were really there. As if they were really there. Write it like a love letter. Even write it as a letter. So that's a huge issue. Who are you writing for? And here's another one. While your memories are your own, there's this question arises. Is the purpose to resolve your past or to entertain others? Now this is the most difficult one to think about. Is your purpose to, to resolve your own past or to entertain others? Well, you're going to say to me, Michael, you've told me to know your world. Only write about your experience and your life. And then you've told me, don't be going into the public memory, go into the private, personal memory. You're saying to me, you're writing to the, the person you love as if it was never being published, as if it's just you and them, and you're just writing absolutely personally to them. So, to answer your question, Michael... Is it to resolve your past or to entertain others? The answer would be, well, it's, it's certainly not to entertain others. This must be to resolve my own past. And of course I'd say to you, no. Contradictory as it may sound. The extraordinary act of love that writing is. And this is what it costs. Costing not less than everything, as somebody said. But this is what the writing costs. That it is as personal as the stories and memories you would share with a loved one or a therapist in the secrecy of intimate relationship. And yet, you're such you're involved in such an abandonment of yourself that you're doing it with the awareness that it might entertain somebody. And I really mean that. The entertaining is the first door that your readers will open. It's the first page they'll open. Entertain me. And at the end of it, they may weep because you have shared your unique story. The great thing about storytelling is that my story 
the more singular and unique it is, will have an echo with you. And you will realise it's your story as well. And ultimately, we begin to realise that there is something called our story. That the private story, let's say a book, John Steinbeck, The Pearl. The Pearl is a very, very personal little narrative. But it's the story of every relationship. It's not just the story of the two people in it. Far away as they live from here, they're not diving for pearls in Loch Allen. And yet the story in that book that I haven't read for 40 years and I still vaguely remember it as a beautiful intimacy and an intimacy that's not explicit. It, it's show, don't tell. It's, it's hinted at. It's gorgeous. And tragic in the end. And it's a lovely and perfect book to study the whole idea of reversal. But what I'm saying is that the more personal you make your story, it becomes more public because it, it hits more people. The more personal it is, the more it is my story. The more you use kind of um, paragraphs or chapters to to talk about or to explain your childhood or your memories or to contextualise them. and The more you make it like Everything else, the more uninteresting it is, because it doesn't hit the person as personal. And it does feel like an act of love. I, I think I've always felt that about storytelling, that it fulfills me at a very, very deep spiritual level. And in a sense, you know, if, if I had which wouldn't have been possible, but if I, if I had stayed as a cleric, as a clergyman in the religion of the Christian, I, I don't, I'd be dead or my soul would be dead. I mean, it's, it's you know, you can't hypothesize about, you know, unlived lives. But I certainly know that when I abandoned the clerical state and became a writer, I found a way to almost, if you like, become a priest. I, I be. I, be, I found a way to become a Christian. And when I'm writing in the Irish Times or I'm writing a memoir, number one, I'm trying to entertain you. I'm trying to be funny. I'm trying to tell the story as, as would amuse you. But number two, I'm prepared to use my soul's private experience and worries and anxieties. And by sharing them like I was sharing them with an intimate therapist beside me here in the room, and yet I'm I'm letting you listen to the tape. That's what works. That's what works in podcasts for me. I've said things in podcasts so personal about my own fate that I wouldn't have ever dreamt I'd said them. And yet I'm doing them to entertain you. It's a strange kind of paradox, but it's a crucial, I think, crucial idea for storytelling. Now, I'm always delighted when I get sidetracked. And I got sidetracked in this podcast about the art of memoir because I just love talking about it and I didn't get around to doing all the stuff that I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was, was share another column, talk about that, and then go on to share with you just some some really, really beautiful experiences I've had recently with Islam. And, and it, it came from the fact that I went over to Birmingham last weekend and I was walking around Birmingham and I thought I was in Islamabad. And I mean that in the most positive and wonderful way. There is now a powerful, strong, vibrant village life in areas of Birmingham, which is moulded and collected into the great tradition of Islam. And my goodness, I found it just 
just everything. I'll be writing about it in the Irish Times in a week or two. And I'd love to share some feelings I've had about Islam and how, you know, we are all Christian, Jew and Muslim. We are all of the Abrahamic faith, the faith of Abraham. We're, we're all singularly one in that, that there is one God, that everything, as, as the Archbishop of Canterbury said in a podcast recently, there is no such thing as dead matter to a Christian. There is no dead matter. The cosmos tingles. I was talking last week in the podcast about, you know, the, the flower, the flowering of the universe and the cosmic Christ. Islam has, Islam just envelops that. It affirms everything that went before and makes it, in a sense, succinct. That there is one God. Look, I, I, I feel so lucky to be alive. I am like grasping to see the top of a mountain with a little flickering candle, with a nightlight at the bottom of the mountain. I am not a scholar, I'm not wise, I'm not a teacher, I'm not even I'm not even a good teacher in relation to creative writing. All I feel about it is I share my story with you. I share my enthusiasms for for writing or for faith with you. I feel that the process of what we do, rather than the content, is what's important. And so what's important is when I'm in this room, showery day, although I see a break in the clouds, so who knows, we we can always be surprised in Ireland by a good day. But I sit in this room alone this morning. I love being in this, the studio shed in Leitrim. I love being in it. And I feel always, when I get into the podcast, you are present. Though I, I, I know you not. I don't know who they are. But it is you. And then I get sing, signals back from people sometimes and it's a joy. But, And I hope that you feel that sense that the, the dynamic of a podcast, like a prayer moment, is able to transcend linear time and space. And in the eternal now, both of us are here in this moment. That's what I love about it and that's what I say. Thank you for every week a joy to be with you in this adventure. So thank you for being here. Bye-bye.